Hello, everybody, and welcome to this twinning webinars entitled Building a Culture of Wellbeing at School with Thinking Routines. So today we focus on the key topic of well-being at school. And for this uh, nice occasion, I have the pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker for today's webinar, Kiriaki Melio. Kiriaki Melio is educational consultant for primary education and among the authors of the new national curriculum of early childhood education in Greece. So today she will guide you throughout the topics of this session. And I've also the honor of introducing you to our second guest speaker for uh, the day, who is moderator of the feature group uh, Creative Classroom. So welcome, Angeliki. And um, before uh, leaving you to the session of today, I would like just to remind you that uh, this session is recorded and the recording of this webinar will be uh, published on our official YouTube channel as of the next day, the YouTube channel of the European School Education Platform, and will be also uploaded in the feature group moderated by Angeliki, and I will post the link in the chat uh, in a few, in few minutes uh, as of the next days. Also, I strongly encourage you to use the chat to pose any questions for our speaker, uh, Kiriaki. And in case there is any time at the end of the session, I'm sure that she will be happy to address uh, your uh, questions if relevant to the topics addressed today. So without further ado, I will now leave the floor to Kiriaki. Please, the floor is yours. Hi, Alessia. Hi, Angeliki. Hi, dear participants. <laughs> Happy, happy to be among such an inspiring learning community. Uh, I'm not sure if Angeliki would like to say something before we start this webinar. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, it is a great pleasure for uh, the Creative Classroom group to welcome uh, Kiriaki Melu, a participant and a friend of um, a partner and a friend of mine in many projects, and one of them is going to present to you today. And uh, uh, here is the link of the Creative Classroom uh, for all of you in case you are not still uh, uh, yet members of uh, this uh, very big uh, community. So uh, the Creative Classroom uh, um, aims to uh, involve you in uh, uh, many uh, well-being activities as uh, reaching out to the end of uh, this uh, year. And uh, so this is why we invited uh, Kiriaki to present uh, to us uh, the building uh, uh, building a culture of well-being at school with uh, with thinking routines. So Kiriaki, welcome, and uh, let us know what are these thinking routines. Okay, thank you, Angeliki, and thanks for sharing uh, this beautiful collaboration that we had all those years. I'm really thrilled to be among you and uh, to share uh, my experience with uh, thinking routines. So uh, just a few words before we begin about today's menu. We will unpack well-being and identify challenges at school. We will introduce the concept of dispositions within the framework of well-being. Then we will present the eight forces that shape a classroom's culture of well-being. And finally, we will explore the theme of today's webinar project zeros thinking routines but from three different and very interesting perspectives so well-being and school um, i don't think we need to say much about well-being uh, um, it's it's a simple concept according to my mind because uh, it connects mostly with feelings uh, with uh, how we feel simply to put well-being is the state of feeling good uh, functioning well and um, another thing that uh, we need um, to focus is that childhood and adolescence is a critical period in the development of long-term attitudes towards uh, personal well-being and of course school uh, I'm not sure if uh, all, of, all of you are teachers uh, it might be interesting uh, to, to just note uh, in the chat if you are teachers the grade level that you teach and in which country so getting back <laughs> to the presentation school has an essential role to play in supporting students to develop those attitudes as well as the associated uh, competencies for well-being 
is it something easy is it something crucial is it something essential i think we already have answered that but just take a look at this uh, slide about the challenges that not only our schools but um, the whole world is facing uh, and affect well-being at school so of course we are living in a world of global cha challenges um, and we often see a worrying decline in basic skills and poorer mental health students increased exposure to bullying uh, anxiety and stress are some of those challenges that have negative consequences on mental health and of course well-being so some key data that uh, I have included uh, in uh, this slide, 9 million adolescents from 10 to 19 years old in Europe are dealing with mental health challenges. One in five adolescents from uh, 11 to 17 years old reports feeling unhappy and anxious about the future. Across Europe, 25% of pupils report having been bullied in the past month, while 50% report having experienced cyberbullying in the past. 13% of adolescents in 23 European countries feel lonely while at school. In Europe, suicide is the second most common cause of death among adolescents aged from 15 to 19 years old. And finally, and I consider this very important as, as, as a teacher, as a consultant, 70% of parents say they would choose to send their children to a school with below average exam results if students, if their children were happy there. And this is something that we really need to keep in mind. So what matters for education in today's world? With these facts in mind, education in today's world is no longer just about teaching students something. Um, it's not about asking them to memorize uh, things, but about helping them develop a reliable compass and the tools to confidently navigate through an increasingly complex and uncertain world. Success in education today is about a positive sense of identity, ability to manage emotions, to have self-esteem. It's about building and maintaining positive and supportive relationships, feeling safe, feeling respected, feeling a sense of belonging to classroom and school. But how are schools promoting well-being among students? And what are the aspects of pedagogical practices that foster to support well-being education? Let me give you an example. What if we ask our students, can you respect people that have different beliefs from your own? And now, what if we ask them, do you respect people that have different beliefs from your own? You know, these are very different questions and the answer may well be yes to the first and no to the second. This first question asks about ability. Can you do something? While the second asks much more. It goes beyond ability and asks about inclination. Are you disposed to respect people that have different beliefs from your own. And in both cases, ability alone is not enough to ensure an ongoing well-being performance. In other words, students um, just knowing, just having learned that respect is a required skill for well-being does not guarantee the disposition to be respectful. So um, the general idea of these positions is that people behave in a more or less informed and appropriate way, guided not only by knowledge, not only uh, by skills, but by tendencies, by dispositions. For instance, we speak of our students as more or less uh, reasonable, thoughtful, friendly, responsible, and so on. 
such dispositions address what our students are inclined to do within the range of their knowledge and their capabilities. So to understand competencies, we need to also involve dispositions. In other words, we need to think through their capacity, sensitivity and inclination to mobilize and deploy relevant psychological resources in order for them to respond appropriately and effectively to the demands, challenges and opportunities presented by specific situations. So supporting well-being at school requires emphasizing our teaching in some core dispositions that are important for students to acquire uh, for maintaining safety, mental health and building um, strong relationships at school. So uh, I have included three core dispositions within the slide. But that doesn't mean that uh, you need to restrict yourself only to those three, but I consider them very important so as to share within this slide. So the disposition, the first disposition to be resilient. This disposition involves the capacity, the sensitivity and inclination to regulate emotions effectively, maintain control of a situation and think of new ways to tackle problems, be compassionate towards ourselves. Don't punish ourselves when facing hardships. The disposition to understand perspectives, again, it involves the capacity, sensitivity and inclination to recognize that others may have different views from our own, to empathize with others and try to interpret their emotional state. And finally, to seek to understand their experiences. Third, the disposition to communicate and build relationships across difference. Again, it involves the capacity, sensitivity and inclination to listen openly and mindfully to the many languages people use to communicate. And, you know, we live in multicultural classrooms. We have among us people who are very different, uh, especially to their ethnicity, to the language they speak. It is not only the mother tongue. It is not only the official language that help us to communicate. It is the verbal, the visual, the body language. We need to um, pay attention to, to uh, the messages they send us. Uh, in the Reggio Emilia philosophy um, uses um, a term that I really love. It is the multi-voiced children, children that are able to communicate through uh, so many different forms. Express with purpose, audience and context in mind. And finally, appreciate and reflect on respectful and inclusive dialogue across race, nationality, gender, religion, and ethnicity. Those dispositions are formed when students systematically engage in a culture of well-being at school. Because culture is not only about skills, culture is shaped by beliefs, by tendencies and behaviors. Thus, to answer the question, what makes a culture of well-being, we need to begin by asking ourselves first, what do I want the students I teach to be like as adults? And I encourage you to use the chat and just write the first word, the first adjective that comes to your mind and uh, describes um, what you want, just, just an adjective, what you want your students you teach to be like as adults. So, just write the first word that comes to your mind and I will ask Angeliki to help me with the chat and, and read what the beautiful community we have here uh, would like to share. 
So they say that uh, Thecla says that uh, they she would like to to be have students to be responsible, tolerant people. Uh, other participants uh, like Michaela write uh, that uh, they she would like to be honest, happy people, a person with uh, critical thinking, happy again. I think that uh, we all need uh, our students to be happy adults huh? with empathy as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, frequently I have teachers engage with this question and they usually respond like you did. Just look what they said. They say that we are hoping for someone who is able to problem solve, to be creative, open-minded, collaborative, empathetic, willing to take risks, healthy, respectful, compassionate, and the list goes on. So exactly what, what you wrote in the chat, eh? am I correct, Agilgi? I think we had exactly similar <laughs> adjectives. So. So it's yes, easy. and uh, mm -hmm. some, sorry to interrupt you, Kiriaki, yeah, some yeah, others yeah. Uh, wrote uh, also tolerant, empathetic, uh, um, and they focus on uh, tolerance and the, uh, also empathy and also active listeners. Wow, amazing. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for these beautiful views. So as you see, there is often an emphasis on these positions that drive well-being. But also, you will notice that there are few traditional academic skills mentioned. Does that mean they aren't important? Of course not. It's just that they do not adequately define the kind of students we collectively hope to send into the world. So the big question, of course, is how do we get there? Eh? How do we create a culture of well-being? And what are the forces we must master to truly transform our schools? So this question is not only important for us, but it has been very important for Project Zero, a research center housed at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, with the purpose to examine fundamental questions of human expression and development. Just to give you an idea, among the brilliant academics and researchers that belong to Project Zero, most of you, uh, you will probably know Professor Howard Gardner, the expert of multiple intelligences, a theory hailed by educators throughout the world and adopted by almost all official curricula. Uh, of course, the Greek curriculum <laughs> is not uh, is either one that has um, embraced this amazing theory. So let's get back to the concept of school culture. So Project Zero's research focuses teacher attentions, uh, attention on eight cultural forces uh, present in every classroom and in every learning situation, which act as shapers of the classroom's cultural dynamic. And as you see in this, in this slide, they consist of expectations, opportunities, time, modeling, language, environment, interactions, and finally, routines. I think that we will save the presentation, but if, if it would be helpful for, uh, for um, our participants to share the link that leads to the culture of thinking, whatever you wish, I am with you. <laughs> so, okay. okay, I will uh -huh. put it in the chat box, okay? Okay, okay. Okay, so let's, let's go through uh, these uh, eight forces, starting with uh, expectations. Expectation, what does it mean? It means setting an agenda for well-being and the competencies required to develop and then convey clear expectations uh, to our students. So traditionally, teaching has focused on setting expectations. It, it's not something new, but it is something that mostly connects for behavior. Expectations for behavior according to the work to be completed over the course. So although certainly important in terms of uh, class order, such expectations do little to motivate well-being in learning. 
but rather they do more to create a culture of compliance, a culture of passivity. Expectations provide the focus and direction for well-being, but opportunities are a mechanism by which those expectations will be realized. So as educators, we need to provide purposeful activities that require students to engage in well-being and the development of relevant competencies as part of their ongoing experience of the classroom. Embedded within the creation of opportunities is the provision of adequate time. Of course, we never have time, but we need time for developing competencies, for emotional and social uh, well-being, such as practicing stress management. Do we do that in school? Building resilient, healthy, uh, able to communicate students and develop meaningful relationships. And then modeling, and of course I'm not, I'm not referring to the instructional modeling, but to demonstrating of who the teacher is and how they feel positive about the school. Co consider ourselves many times, I mean, we, we all feel burnout, okay? But entering the class with this disposition, how this will be conveyed to our students. But then if we demonstrate of how we feel positive about the school, how we can regulate our emotions, how open we are to change and how we form good teacher, students, parent relationships. Relevant to modeling is also the language teachers use to provide students with the vocabulary for describing and reflecting on competencies related to well-being. Don't forget uh, Vygotsky's learning theory that the child begins to perceive the world not only through its eyes but also through its speech. So think for a moment, how often do we include words or phrases and discussions that deepen students' understanding about well-being? Or how often do we provide clear information about the competencies that drive a welcoming environment where everyone at school can feel supported and safe. The physical environment of a school is yet another factor that shapes the culture of well-being. We need to think the needs of our students and we need to continue construct and reconstruct our classroom to fit those needs. For instance, you, you mentioned before in the, in the chat, tolerance, you mentioned respect, respect to diverse viewpoints. This requires a space where the desks are arranged in such a way that allows students to communicate, to discuss, to share, debate and engage with one another. Well-being also uh, benefits from the records and documentation of the student's decision about the norms for promoting respect, happiness, participation, and other factors that connect uh, with well-being. Although we can infer uh, a lot uh, about essence of the physical environment of the classroom, perhaps nothing speaks louder about the culture of the classroom or than the interactions that take place inside it. At the heart of interactions lies a number of competencies, such as interest for others' emotional situation and physical health, and respect for their beliefs and values. This is the basis for positive interactions that shape meaningful collaboration and exchange, which in turn help to build a culture of well-being. Exactly as dispositions, cultural forces requires learners to routinely engage in specific patterns of behaviors and performances. This notion leads us to thinking routines, the last cultural force that also links to the title of this expert talk. 
So routines can be thought of as any procedure, process or pattern of action that is used repeatedly to manage and facilitate the accomplishment of specific goals or tasks. Of course, classrooms are dominated by such routines. Teachers have routines that serve to manage student behavior and interaction, um, routines to organize the work environment, to facilitate transitions or to maintain rules for communication and discourse. These simple procedures, usually consisting of only a few steps, provide a framework for focusing attention on specific competencies that can help to build a culture of well-being. Just as routines for lining up or handing in homework become ingrained, thinking routines are also become part of the fabric of the classroom over time. To understand how they operate in the classroom and how you might use them, it is helpful to look at routines from three perspectives, as tools, as structures, and as patterns of behavior. Thinking routines can operate as tools for promoting well-being. Just like any tool, it is important to choose the right one for the job. Therefore, you must first identify what kind of competence you are trying to develop and then select the particular thinking routine as the tool for that job. So, should we try an activity to warm up? Okay, Angeliki will share in the chat this link of a Padlet. Um, so, let me just give you uh, a few a few information before getting engaged with these uh, activities. So you will think that as teachers you are sharing a story about loneliness. What is your goal? Your goal is to develop the competence of perspective taking by asking students to hypothesize how the character of the story feels so as to encourage empathetic responses. Now, we said before that thinking routines, we can consider them as tools. So, so to succeed this goal, uh, I have placed uh, two guides of two different routines. You need to take a look at the purpose, not read the whole guide, but just focus on the purpose of each thinking routine. And you need to choose the most effective tool between the two suggested ones. So, this is the Padlet, and Yelki has already shared the link. Read the instruction and share your ideas. But please don't forget to briefly explain what makes you say that. Why did you choose the routine? Okay? So you can have like 10 minutes to start um, adding your, your comments. And... We will wait. Okay, Angeliki, I will try to check the Padlet. I hope my screen will not disappear. <laughs> I, I'm doing the experiment. Okay. Okay. So open the two guides. You can see two different routines. Again, I am reminding you that your goal is to develop the competence of perspective taking. So, what which of the two tools of the two thinking routines you consider the most appropriate to succeed this goal? You don't need, as I told you before, you don't need to read the whole guide. That just focus on the purpose of its thinking routine. Add your comment and don't forget to uh, briefly explain why you made uh, this choice. What did you see in the thinking, in the thinking routine that uh, actually made you uh, to select this specific one among the two? In the, in the chat box, the link of the Padlet, you may open it in your browser 
and uh, navigate what uh, Kiriaki uh, posted there for you and uh, uh, feel free to take part in this activity. Okay, we have a few moments. It's not that difficult. <laughs> I think the routine speaks by themselves. <laughs> So just give it a try and we will be happy. Just to let you know, there are no right or wrong answers when it comes to the routine, to the routines. The only thing that matters is uh, to, to support uh, our opinion with an argument, with evidence. Okay, so you may, you may add whatever you wish, feel free. To share your opinions. Just to let them know, Kiriaki, that ah. uh, both of us, uh, we use these thinking routines at our classrooms and projects. And uh, of, course. Uh, of course, uh, I did it um, uh, as a pilot uh, project uh, during the COVID situation. And uh, my students used to work online using these uh, thinking routines uh, in Project Zero. So why not give it a try? Mm -hmm. Sure. And uh, something, something, I see something. We have already a couple of answers in the chat. Yes. Um, uh, Aneta Bukomani wrote that uh, she would prefer the step inside routine because it helps students to explore different perspectives. Uh, that uh, what uh, empathy means to understand others' position. Uh, Athena wrote a uh, step inside routine as well it, because it gives students a chance to emphasize, um, uh, empathize uh, with the character in the story. Um, Thekla wrote uh, that uh, step inside uh, as well as it explores different perspectives and the uh, viewpoints. Uh, you try to imagine things, events, problems or issues uh, differently. So you hypothesize how the character feels, how you get in his or her shoes. And uh, Maria wrote uh, we should, uh, that uh, we should choose the first routine. Uh, because uh, the step uh, the step inside one uh, uh, because uh, we want to cultivate emotions and the children's empathy that's um, many comments in the chat box in mm -hmm. okay great so most of you uh, prefer the step inside thinking routine and uh, if I was in classroom right now that would be the thinking routine that also I would choose maybe one, another problem. One, yes, yes. By stepping inside, uh, um, Anna uh, writes uh, uh, the stepping in, by stepping inside the perspective of another person, students or individuals learn to imagine the thoughts, feelings, and motivations of someone else. This helps them develop empathy, which is crucial for navigating social interactions and building relationships. It can be uh, especially useful in diverse groups, promoting inclusivity and reducing uh, biases. Oh my goodness. Okay, Th thank you for this very, very, hi Anna. Thank you for these very thoughtful comments. I think we, we will keep them and then go straight <laughs> for a publication of an article. You are all amazing. Thank you so much for, for sharing those great views. So, yes, exactly as you said, I mean, uh, what was your goal, our goal, uh, and then again, another comment, I mean, something comes up and then it goes, so I will give you will have yes, this. Yes, uh, <laughs> step inside, I think that this step is the routine that uh, dominates, step inside the thoughts and feelings of the person. Uh, and uh, also one more comment, uh, Despina says that uh, she would also go for the first one because she believes students can uh, relate easily and realize common points with the characters. Exactly, exactly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So you are ready to use the thinking routines. I'm pretty sure I'm very confirmed and I encourage you to do so. So this was the first perspective. Just let me give you an example from the classroom. So um, this example comes from uh, Vicky. Vicky is a first grade teacher of a reception class in Greece. Uh, 
um, are you familiar with what the reception class is? Of course, uh, our Greek friends here, uh, they know. But just to give you an idea, um, those classrooms receive uh, diverse students that they do not speak the mother language uh, and they help them through different um, activities uh, to get uh, accustomed and familiar with uh, the spoken language. So um, Vicky was um, a first grade teacher of the reception class in Greece, as I told you. She introduced this routine to, in to engage both Greek and foreign students with each other's uh, experiences but in a balanced emotional way and i'm saying that because um, many times that we work with teachers uh, using the step inside routine we were always um, a little bit hesitant like what what will happen if a student comes up with a difficult emotion and we don't know how to handle that because of course we are teachers we're not psychologists but uh, look how Vicky handled this situation. So, drawing upon relevant children's books, she organized several uh, role-playing activities and she encouraged her students to select a character. I mean, sh she gave them many books, but uh, from their favorite book to select a character and immerse themselves into their viewpoint. So, one of the books dealt with the resilience of students with an immigrant background and describe the difficulties uh, Pablo, which was the character in the story, faced in making friends and belong to a social group because he didn't spoke the language. So Greek students stepping inside Pablo's shoes commented that they knew I'm sad that I'm invisible and that I care about having friends and being accepted. So Vicky found the impact of this routine in this situation very powerful, not only for developing the competence of perspective taking, but also for fostering cultural forces such as language by including words and phrases that deepen students' understanding of perspective taking, uh, opportunities for practicing empathy and positive interactions among diverse students because they had tried stepping into their shoes, at least for a while. Uh, so this was the first um, perspective of looking at thinking routines. Now let's see uh, thinking routines as structures. And of course, thinking routines have been carefully crafted to support and structure students' thinking. The steps in all of the routines follow a natural progression in which each, steps, each step builds on and extends the thinking of the previous one. Therefore, in using the routines, the goal is never simply to fill out or complete one step and move on uh, to the next, but to use the thinking occurring at each step in the following steps. For instance, uh, the sitting water routine that you see in the slide emphasizes the importance of observation as the basis for the thinking and interpretation step that follows the clock looking. So what do you see is the first step. Focus on what do you see and what in what elements you can actually see. Not just say what, not saying what you think is going on in the pictures, but exactly what you see. So having a number of visual elements, then based on what you see, you can move to what you think. And finally, what are you wondering based on what you have seen and have been thinking? So we will do another activity together and this will be the last one, I promise you that. <laughs> so just... Just go again on a Padlet activity, but this time I will ask you not to write in the chat if, if this is, um, of course, if this is convenient for you, but uh, uh, prefer uh, to work in the Padlet. As you see, I have included um, a picture. Uh, if you know what the picture is about, just keep it in your head and don't share it, just keep it to yourselves. But try not... Um, to get influenced of what you think 
is going on in the picture. Okay, so start but what, by what you see. State exactly what you notice. And keep in mind that we are not looking for interpretations right now. We only want you to write what you observe. So you click on the comments, there is a small uh, cross, you click on that to add your comment in the C part. Then according to what you have seen, you will click and add another comment on the think uh, part. So based on what you are seeing, what does it make you think? What is going on in this picture? What kinds of interpretations? Uh, can you uh, form based on your observations? And finally, move on the wonder step and uh, write what you are now wondering about based on what you have seen and have been thinking. So we want you here to add some comments about what still remains unclear, what you cannot support by evidence and you wish to explore more. So you can take like, let's say, um, 10 minutes. Because as, as we said before, we need to give time. <laughs> and time is never on our side. But you will get like 10 minutes, not 15, 10. But I am sure you will be uh, able to use the routine and enjoy your comments. We already have the first comment. Ah, yeah? From, yeah, okay. yeah, from Madina. Uh, to the sea, uh, what do you see? She says, she wrote that, uh, she writes that she see two girls talking on the edge and uh, the shadows of other kids looking. And one more at the same uh, calling uh, from Catalina, who wrote, uh, two girls are standing facing each other. Exactly. Thank you so much for just stating what you see and not get into any interpretations of what you think is going on. Okay. We have another another C comment. Uh, yeah, from uh, Defian. Uh, a girl talking to another and also shadows of others. Mm. That's wonderful, wonderful. Keep on adding comments like that, stating only what you see, nothing more. Only what you see. Things that you can actually uh, catch or point your finger to. Only what you see. One more, uh, two more comments. Uh, Marianthi says that uh, she, she sees two girls standing near a cliff and shadows of others. And Despina, two girls are having a conversation. One of them is standing next to the edge and we can see shadows of other people mm -hmm. standing near them and then a shadows clouds. Okay, J just a moment. Just let me say something here. Despina, uh, I would like to, to keep your comment saying that we are not sure if they have a conversation. This is an interpretation, okay? We cannot actually see that, okay? Uh, just to explain the routine, but thank you so much for sharing. So two girls standing next to the edge, of course we can see shadows of other people. Are they other people? Maybe it is something else we, we still don't know. Standing near them, thank you so much for sharing. I'm just, I'm just explaining because we often tend to, to make interpretations. But here we need to pause a little bit and just focus on what we see. Now, based on what you have seen, please uh, move. We have, to... we have two more comments or three. Uh, okay. Loyal is uh, writing that. Uh, uh, is seeing two girls at the end of uh, the mountain. They are quarreling. One of them has got a uh, support from the oh socium because I can see shadows. Okay, and loyal, loyal. Just wait, 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 wait. Let's and not Maria, interpret. And yeah, okay. and Maria uh, wrote that she sees shadows, two girls' clouds, Tecla, two girls looking at each other, one taller looks down on the other, the shortest looks up to the other, other children looking at them, shadows can be seen, and okay. the calm, one girl on the brink of the cliff, another girl right opposite to her, and shadows. And we have also 
uh, the first comments in the, uh, the... Uh, Adeliki, please let's let's just a moment but we need to, to be clear within the thinking routines just to make sure that we don't know um just just a moment to find the comment just a moment, just a moment. ah yes we don't know if they are quarreling we don't know if they are having a conversation this is just an interpretation we make according to what we see okay just to make sure that you all have understand how the c part works okay thank you thank you thank you uh do we have uh, yeah i see some comments on the think part so i will give this uh one more in the first one asking the little one what happened the, ah, then, again, again this is an interpretation we're not we don't know that for sure okay, okay this is something go. that we think is going on we don't see it exactly okay? so we think according according to the fian that perhaps a scene of a pupil being bullied Catalina mm -hmm. also that the taller girl scolds the shorter one. Lindida giving advice to Michaela that it is a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. Adina, one of the girls is on a power position. Uh, the small one seems to be intimate, intimidated. Mm -hmm. Marianne, the taller girl is talking to the shorter girl who is near the cliff. The shorter girl seems scared or worried. And Maria look each other, maybe having a conversation. Loyal, it's very dangerous situation. I think it is a scene mm -hmm. of bullying. Uh, just a moment, Agelki. Yes, right now we can accept what we think is going on. Yes, I think it is a sense of bullying. Very correct. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, Calm wrote uh, that uh, thinks what, whether the girl whose back uh, we can look uh, at is uh, trying to help or press the shorter girl. Uh, I somehow uh, says that uh, confuses uh, think with wonder. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Anna wrote uh, in this image we can observe a dynamic where the taller girl who stands with confidence may appear to have an upper hand in the interaction. Mm -hmm. The shorter girl with her arms closed behind her back might seem more reserved, perhaps feeling hesitant or less mm -hmm. assertive. Mm -hmm. Their mm -hmm. body language suggests con, uh, contrasting roles of emotions. The taller girl may be taking uh, on a more dominant role, while the other might feel at a disadvantage or the avoiding conflict, uh, be mm -hmm. avoiding conflict, displaying a stance that reflects introvers introversion or, or acceptance of uh, the established di dynamic. And okay. Thekla wrote that the um, taller girl asks uh, the shortest to justify her behavior. She might have some, uh, she might have done something. Wonderful, wonderful. The thing part, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Now let's move because I think we have already some comments on the wonder. Here again, uh, we need to state what remains unclear, eh? what we need to explore more. Maybe we don't know, of course we don't know everything. What do we need? What answers do we have? So, Angelique? We, we have an answer from Adina, uh, mm -hmm. who wrote that she wonders if the small girl is bullied or they are playing. Lindy uh, wonders if uh, these girls are relatives. Artistic uh, Seahorse wrote that the bullying discussion between maybe the or no maybe uh, it's a bullying discussion between two girls. Catalin uh, wonders what happened earlier. Marianthi uh, wonders if the taller girl is trying to show her superiority in front mm. of her peers in the shadows. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Cal <laughs> Calm wrote uh, that uh, are the shadows uh, wonders are the shadows yeah. viewers <laughs> of a sort of Hunger Games, well, Hunger Games show. show. Amazing, amazing. And Tecla, is it a bullying incident? Is mm -hmm. shortest victim uh, of bullying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, here, uh, let me say, Kiryaki, something to Aneta, who uh, can't, um, uh, who is not able to write uh, down in the Padlet. Uh, maybe she could uh, write the comment here, and we will add it uh, to oh. to the Padlet. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. So. What, what did you experience through this activity? It was much, much deeper, although we didn't have enough time, believe me, but it was much deeper of just 
sharing a picture uh, in our classroom and just asking our students to say what you think is going on within this picture. So um, supporting your interpretation with evidence that you see, uh, you, you now see how deep within the image we were able to go. Just let me give you an example, uh, an authentic example from the classroom. So um, you see here how it was documented, the same thing in routing with the same picture, uh, a picture that is that comes from the, the famous photographer Matt Mahurin, and of course it is about bullying, you were able to see that. So look how students of fifth grade uh, began with the C parts. I see two girls facing each other, the shorter is standing at the edge of a cliff, the taller is holding her fists clenched, both wear similar clothes, although the shorter girl were, wears sneakers and the taller black ballerinas. Uh, there are five very similar shadows. The sky is cloudy. The colors are mainly dark. Most of these observations were also documented within your comments. So using uh, these observations, uh, the students in the, in the thing part said that the tall girl speaks angrily. She may be friends with the shadows because they are standing on the same side. The tall girl is the teacher uh, who is arguing the little one in front of the class, referring to the shadows. The young girl accepts that the other uh, accepts what the other tells her because there is no way out for her. And finally, in the wonder step. Students said that uh, they were wondering about what is the relationship between the, uh, the two girls. Are they friends? Are they classmates? Is it the teacher and the student? What happened and got there? Why the shadows don't move? Why they don't help? Why the girl doesn't call for help? Where are their parents, teachers or friends? So how this thinking routine, let's go back to the thinking routine, can help us. You see that the ability to notice details in the C-step took students deeper into the image. Thus, in the think step, they draw on evidence from their observations to provide interpretations about bullying as a group process in which persons have different participant roles. And finally, in the wonder step, the questions, you see how broad they were and not limited to those that require a yes or no answer. Huh? Uh, guiding students to explore also bullying prevention strategies, such as building a community of support. You see, they ask why, why um, she didn't cry for help, uh, why uh, the shadows do not move. Oh my goodness, we don't have time. So let's, <laughs> let's move forward on the third perspective of how we can use thinking routines. And this is as patterns of behavior. So the idea of thinking routines must be understood as well being culture builders. When thinking routines are used regularly in classrooms and become part of the, of the pattern of the classroom, students internalize messages about what well-being is and how it happens. One of the things you will notice in many of the routines is that they are designed not to elicit specific answers, but actually to uncover students' ideas around the topic or around an issue. And this is very helpful, especially in the case of students who may feel stressed, or insecure to speak directly about an incident or an issue that concerns them. For instance, the color symbol image routine is perfect for making students thinking visible in a way that does not rely so heavily on the use of written or oral language. So this routine asks students to identify and distill the essence of ideas taking from the reading or from personal experiences that is hard to distill through words. Um, and, and how they are able to do that by using either um, a color or a symbol or an image. So thinking uh, through those metaphors 
sends the message that there is not a right or wrong answer and also that learning is not a process of absorbing information but what truly matters is welcoming everyone's ideas and consider how important and how encouraging this might be for students that are afraid to open up or they don't want to speak or because they trust no one. So let me share you an example of the color symbol image. So uh, this comes from Poppy, she, she's a sixth grade teacher. She noticed that many of her students uh, were facing serious stress and anxiety for the transition between primary and secondary school. So she decided to use color symbol image as a tool to help her students express their inner thoughts without being on the spot and reflect on the upcoming school year. So she asked them to think about what being a secondary student means to them and what color they might give secondary school. So you see the student here, uh, this comes from a boy, um, he chooses red. He says, I choose red because of the many changes that are going to happen. And what we know, we know that the primary color of stress is red. She then asked them uh, to think of what kind of symbol they would uh, pick to stand for being in secondary school. What the student said, he said that I choose the question mark because secondary is something new for me. So um, if we explore a little bit about symbols, you will see that the question mark may link to negative emotions like fear when children, uh, when older kids are about to experience an unknown situation. And finally, she asked them to draw pictures that for them represented their hopes about secondary school. And looking at the picture, look what the, what the student says, I choose to draw my friends because I hope we will be uh, in the same classroom, we will all be in the same classroom. So we can understand the worries this student has if they will be able to maintain their friendships across the transition to secondary school. Would that be uh, easy to uncover by asking them how, how you feel? Maybe not. So uh, our time is, <laughs> is very pressing. So for you who would like to explore more about thinking routines, I suggest uh, you should go directly to this link. Um, you will see uh, Project Zero's Thinking Routine Toolbox. Uh, there are all the guides of all thinking routines. And uh, also, um, there is a very uh, helpful uh, categorization about the thinking routines that, uh, that will help you either to think of them as core thinking routines or use them for introducing, exploring new ideas, uh, whatever works for you. Just just um, think uh, that they are, uh, the thinking routines are very flexible and um, the only thing you need to have clear in your head is to have specific uh, goals. Uh, before I end uh, my presentation, uh, just an idea that I would like to share with you that I used to do with my students when I was in the classroom. I call them acts of well-being inspired by thinking routines. So what if you start your day with a headline that indicates your most important strength or value to begin the day or the week? Think of who you are, who am I? And look for similarities among others around you that maybe seem different, but maybe they are not. What concerns you and what are your circles of action that can help you to find solutions? And finally, consider how else and why you can say something and reflect on how respectful is your interaction with others. Thank you so much for your attention. For those who have uh, questions, I will be more than happy to answer. <laughs>
Thank you, Kiryaki, for sharing all these uh, very interesting and inspiring um, uh, things about the thinking routines. And I, I think that this, it could be a task uh, for the audience and all the members of uh, the creative classroom, and not only, if you can go one slide before. And we will have uh, maybe some time uh, to the previous slide about um, uh, the acts of well-being, just to, to think about or um, uh, have uh, in mind here the headline, who I am, circles of action, how well and why. Uh, it would be an interesting um, discussion, maybe a task. We will see how we will handle, handle with it in the creative classroom. Thank you so much. Uh, but I, I I can't see any questions. You said you explained everything so clear. Wow. <laughs> but we have an amazing audience. I mean, uh, I was so impressed by the answers and the comments I saw on the Padlet and on the chat box. So thank you. Thank you for being such an amazing audience. Thank you so much, uh, Kiriaki, and thank you, Angeliki. I'm also seeing the inspired comments in the chat. So thank you for uh, uh, guiding us into this journey on thinking routines. It was uh, really interesting. So thank you, Kiriaki, for sharing your knowledge and time with us. And thank you, Angeliki, for organizing uh, such a nice expert talk. I can see no questions in the chat, but you will have time maybe to follow up in the group uh, if there's any continuation of these reflections. I remind you that the materials, meaning the presentation and the recording, will be available in the group as of the next days. So you will be able to catch up or share with other e-tweeners uh, what you learned today. I thank again our speaker Kiriaki and uh, Angeliki, and I wish you all uh, a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, Alessia. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.